folks. We're just giving everybody a few seconds to log in before we get started here. While we wait to get started, um, putting some info in chat about how you can purchase Julianne's book and get $5 off if you buy through Greenlight. So check that out as you're waiting. All right, good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. We're excited to host tonight's event with Julianne Pacheco presenting her new book, The Ant Hill. She'll be talking with Sergio De La Pava, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just wanna say a huge thanks to everyone for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. Greenlight storefronts are currently closed and locked, but our community is still here. Before we start, I just wanna say, <laughs> Um, now just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, you can see and hear the speakers, but they cannot see or hear you. Uh, they can see your name over in our attendee list and they'll see who you are when you comment in chat or ask questions in our audience Q&A. Uh, if you scroll down to the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll see a few different icons for functions we'll be using during the event. One is labeled chat. Uh, you can comment in here throughout the conversation. If you wanna say hello to the authors, um, comment on any part of the conversation, chat with each other about the conversation in the book, or you know, pro provide some applause um, during after the reading or during highlights in the conversation. Uh, you'll also see down here at the bottom of your Zoom window an icon labeled Q&A, and that is where we'll be pulling questions from at the end of the event during our audience Q&A portion. Uh, you can type questions in there at any time throughout the event as they come to you. And if you see someone else's question that you would really like to have answered, you can upvote it and it'll appear at the top of our window as we're pulling those to ask questions to Julianne. Uh, we are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our website and social media channels later on. And finally, the reason we are all here tonight, books, Tonight's featured book, The Ant Hill, is available for sale from greenlightbookstore.com. Though our stores are closed, we're working with our supplier warehouse for fast direct-to-home shipping. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. And we're offering $5 off on the featured book when you purchase it from Greenlight's website in the next week. Look for the coupon code in the chat. Our interviewer for this evening is Sergio de la Pava. He is the author of the novels A Naked Singularity, Personae, and Lost Empress. He'll be speaking with our featured author, author Julianne Pacheco. She is the author of The Lucky Ones. She grew up in Cali, Colombia, and lived there until she was 18. She has a PhD in creative writing from the University of East Anglia in England, where she is now a lecturer. Her story, Honey Bunny, appeared in The New Yorker, and two of her stories have been anthologized in Best British Short Stories 2015. In 2015, she was long listed for the Sunday Times EFT Short Story Award. And in 2017, she was shortlisted for the Sunday Times Young Writer of the Year Award. Her new book, The Ant Hill, is a searing exploration of privilege, racism, and redemption in the Instagram age, and a wildly original blend of social horror and razor-sharp satire. Julianne is going to start us off with a reading from the book, and then she'll be talking with Sergio and with all of you. Julianne, please take it away. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not super technologically adept, but I can see that there's little chat messages popping up. So those are really nice to see. Um, and I just wanted to thank everyone for being able to attend. I know there's people from, you know, all over the world, from London, I see from Houston, um, from California, from DC. Um, 
So yeah, even though I was supposed to be in, in New York for this event, like maybe it's, it's for the best spot. You know, we all love using Zoom, right? Like we're all just like dying to, to use Zoom as much as possible. Um, so I'm just gonna read for five minutes from the Ant Hill. Um, and I'll just give a little bit of context to what the scene is, and then maybe we'll talk more about what the book is about during the Q&A. But in this scene, we have one of the main characters, the new volunteer who is riding a bus up to the Medellin Barrios where she's going to volunteer. And she's accompanied by a girl from Wales, the Welsh girl who is also um, joining her to volunteer at at the Ant Hill, which is an after school community center that they're traveling to. So, um, yeah, so I'll just read for five minutes and then we can just jump into the, the Q&A portion. I love feeling like I'm in danger, the Welsh girl says as they rattle up the hill. When I was in Brazil and went to the favelas, I've never felt more alive. There were guys walking around with guns everywhere. Guns tucked down the front of their underpants and in plain sight. And the view was beautiful, the Welsh girl continues, nodding at the window, not able to gesture due to her tight grip on the seat cushion. Mountainside views, she says. Isn't it crazy how anywhere else in the world, this view would be prime real estate, like Los Angeles. I moved to LA last year, but what I really want to do is travel. Europe is so boring, she says, as the bus groans its way past two rusty metal dumpsters. Through the grimy bus window, the new volunteer catches a glimpse of a wizened old woman picking through the trash with a stick. The people aren't alive there, the Welsh girl says. Not like here. Everything in Europe is so well arranged, so overprotected. If I can travel for the rest of my life, I'll be happy. It's a romanticized view, the new volunteer says carefully, as the Welsh girl unscrews the cap of her water bottle and takes a long sip. Isn't it? The idea that it's our unique experiences that define us, like those two Berkler poets tramping around the Alps in Italy in the 19th century, the Magic Mountain, Isabel Archer, who? The Welsh girl spills some water on her jeans as the bus bounces over a particularly deep pothole. Oh, this Henry James character, portrait of a lady. It feels dumb to be talking about the Magic Mountain and Henry James on a bus while outside grandmas are picking through garbage in search of food. It feels pretty much like the worst thing in the world. Sorry, the new volunteer says, I'm rambling, but it's an idealized concept isn't it? The idea that if we have enough special, authentic experiences, that those experiences will make us exceptional, singular individuals. And that's to be valued above all else. I couldn't agree with that more, the Welsh girl says. She asks the new volunteer to take a photo of how her knees are crammed in by the seat in front of her. This bus, she says, is insane. No one in my family would believe this bus. This bus, she says, is crazy. The new volunteer has to take the photo several times in order to get the angle the Welsh girl wants. It's hard to keep the phone stable with the bus rattling. Hang on a sec, the new volunteer says, tapping on the square option. Has this phone followed this girl from Wales all over the world? The favelas of Brazil, the hair salons of Los Angeles. If there was a Google Maps line of blue dots, following the Welsh girl around, where else would it go? Tracing her movements through the other desirable Southern countries, maybe. Thailand, Cambodia, meditation centers in India, yoga retreats in Indonesia, and apparently here is Colombia, joining the list of shiny, appealing destinations. But the Welsh girl and her, does she count? The North to Southern flow of people, as opposed to vice versa. She can see them coming, clears anything, as she raises the phone and taps the red button. Digital strategists, venture capitalists, 
dozens of them, countless, pressing their faces eagerly against the walls of the countries they want to enter, rattling the doorknobs in their desperate enthusiasm. How desirable it all was. The dirty, filthy energy of these countries and their shitty buses. How authentic. For them, the doors opened. For them, entrance was permissible. Here they came, were coming, had already come admitted effortlessly, unhesitatingly. Ooh, the Welsh girl says, nodding in approval as the new volunteer hands the phone back. That's a good photo. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you. you know, this is, um, I'm really, I'm really excited and happy to, to be doing this conversation with you. I'm a big fan of yours. Thank you. Um, big fan of, of both uh, The Ant Hill and also your previous book, uh, Lucky Ones. So um, I was wondering, um, you've published books where there hasn't been a global pandemic going on and now you're publishing a book during a global pandemic. Any differences? Nope. <laughs> no, it's the same, basically. Like, nothing's different. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously the lack of movement is a big difference. Like I was saying earlier, um, I would have liked to have been in, in the States for this launch. Um, so yeah, that's probably the biggest movement, uh, the biggest difference is the lack of the ability to travel. But, but in a way it has, I mean, maybe this is like a crazy thing to say to talk about like the benefits or like the advantages of a pandemic, but it does kind of, um, relieve the pressure a bit because it, it makes you think kind of more about like the big picture of things, you know? So rather than kind of like your own petty anxieties, um, you kind of know that there's, there's something bigger going on. But, but as a flip side to that, it's, um, you know, I, I know that I've like personally benefited from, I mean, it was, it was a struggle in the beginning, but it has been nice to be able to like escape into fiction while this has been happening. So whether that be like movies or like TV shows or video games or like novels, um, I think this is kind of like a fruitful time for, for storytellers. And you bring a, an interesting point up. Might it also like be the return of the attention span? Um, because like at the beginning, and, and I hear this a lot, I hear a lot of people say like, I don't even really know what day it is. Like, yeah. <laughs> I've been talking to people and they'll say, I'm not really sure what day it is. And, and, uh, and one of the things it reminds me of is it, it reminds me of kind of deep reading where you don't really, you, you put the book down and you realize you've been sitting on the sofa for six hours or you're not, you really haven't had the greatest conception of time. Um, oh yeah, it's like, what is time anymore? That's definitely a feeling I've been having a lot. Um, but, but yeah, I was actually talking about this with someone earlier. Um, that this idea of, of concentration, of immersion, that that's something that reading can still offer and still teach us. So yeah, I know there's always like questions of kind of like what do these kind of big world events change? But, but yeah, I think that that ability to, to concentrate and just kind of like be present in like one moment is a really strong benefit of a reading. But then again, like I'm biased because I write books. <laughs> so of course I'm going to be like, yeah, you should read them. They're good for you. So, yeah, yeah. That thing where you're confused and you don't know what time it is. It's like reading. I highly recommend it or something. Yeah, exactly. So can you recall uh, like when you started inhabiting the headspace of this work? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I mean, I guess I started writing it um, in 2013. I wrote a short story that was set in an after-school center, the Ant Hill. So it's an idea that I had for a very long time. And partly that came from the feeling that like an after-school center where you have the parents, you have the students, you have the community, you have the staff, you have the volunteers. I just thought it would be an interesting place to write about in terms of all the different personalities um, involved. And 
I also had a, a background in, in education and working in, in places similar to the Ant Hill, the after school center in the book. So, um, so it might've come from that as well, just like based on like my own personal experience. So when you wrote the short story, were you thinking this is part of a novel or did the short story stay with you and you felt the only way you could deal with it was um, by make, making it into a novel or a third option that I can't envision right now? <laughs> no, those, those two options for sure. Um, so at the time when I wrote the first short story, I was working on The Lucky Ones, my first book, which was a, um, sometimes it's called a novel, sometimes it's called like a short story collection. It was basically short stories that were connected. So originally I thought this Ant Hill short story could go in there, but that didn't end up happening. And so then around like 2015, 2016, I wanted to write a novel with kind of like a smaller cast of characters, like something that was more focused. Um, because that's kind of what's really interesting to me about the novel, like the ability to kind of really explore the psychology or like consciousness of kind of um, like a limited group of people. Obviously, that, that's not something that like all novels do, but um, like in The Lucky Ones, it had lots of different characters and like lots of different voices. So with this book, I, I wanted it to be a bit more focused. Well, you know, with the Lucky Ones was a, a series of short stories, but I always, I kind of consider it a novel just because the recursive elements kept coming in yeah. and they built up a novelistic effect. What do you, how do, where do you fall on that? And I realize we're not talking about the actual book at issue, but I do. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's like, I make like my publicist and like my agent, like probably very frustrated with me because I'm just like, call it whatever. Like, I don't care, like novel, short story collection. Um, and that's just like how I am, like personally as a reader, like it doesn't really matter so much how something is, is marketed, but I guess like people bring different expectations to a book, like depending on what it's called. Um, I mean, it's, The Lucky Ones is definitely like a novel in the sense that um you have to read in a certain order whereas with like you know a short story collection you can read it in any order you want whereas with the lucky ones you have to read it in a specific order um i'm, I'm going on purely memory and lucky ones uh, dealt with bogota for example in in some of the stories and is this your first time writing about medellin yeah it's the first time writing about medellin um and i wrote mainly about kali in the lucky ones and i wanted to write about medellin because my twin sister has lived in medellin since since 2010 um so a decade now her partner's from medellin so city i've been to a lot and it was a city i never visited as a child when i was living in kali i mean we we really didn't travel at all um, so it really wasn't the city that I went to until my sister was living there. And when I would visit my sister, even in just the period that she was living there, it was so impactful on me to see the change that the city went through. And I don't know if this is even something that people in New York can say, or like San Francisco, just like seeing how an urban space changes due to gentrification right um so and then the other impactful thing to me was just as a child growing up in Colombia you know Colombia in like 1993 was like not a place that tourists were going to you know and my experience of leaving Colombia and like moving to the U.S. in 2004 and like telling people like oh I grew up in Colombia I'm from Cali people would be like you're from there so it's this kind of look of like horror you know of just like why would you live there right um and so to me it was crazy to see this change of like people you know, to put it quite bluntly, of people like wanting to come to Colombia and to consume Colombia, right? Um, in just like a way I hadn't seen. And so I had ambiguous feelings about that, right? Like, obviously, I think it's wonderful that the country is safer and that um, obviously there are like benefits to, to tourism increasing there. But, but that was just one of the things I just wanted to explore, just 
like on a personal level, like obviously Colombia is a country that's very important to me that I will always have a very strong connection with. It's my childhood home. So having that like feeling of just like, how do I feel about like Colombia being now part of this like international consumption, right? In like in, for tourism specifically. So that was one of the things I wanted to explore. It's funny you talk about, you know, Colombia in the 90s and part of you probably wanted to get offended and be like, boy, you're making it out to be um, something worse than it is. But the reality is that Medellin and Cali were like incredibly dangerous back then. Yeah, they were. And and, um, and it is it is an incredibly intriguing thing to see this shift where it's become kind of um, more of a tourist destination. And I think it seems to me uh, that you are somewhat uh, if I can kind of inject your authorial presence in the book, you are somewhat critical of those who view it as like a, kind of a fun vacation spot that will get maybe add personal intrigue to their story by saying that they spent a summer in Medellin. Is that, am I detecting that properly? Or? Maybe. <laughs> I mean, on one hand, it's like, you know, it's not like I'm this like, like judge with a you know, a passing moral authority on like anyone, right? But like, um, like personally, I do feel a lot of wariness about what I see is this increasingly common tendency of um, like the prevalence of the image, right? And so you can think of that more in terms of just like the photograph of the vacation. Like I want to go here and just like take a nice photo and I don't really want to think about what's behind that, right? And so that's something that I personally feel a bit nervous about of like living in a world where this idea of like the image of like living in a more visual and increasingly more visual culture is something that I feel a bit ambiguous about, right? So, you know, I'm not here to kind of like shame people for just like wanting to take a nice trip. But then I'm like, maybe we should be shamed for wanting to do that, you know? I mean, considering that most, if not all of us are now in a situation where, you know, travel is just off limits, right? Um, you know, maybe that's a time to actually ask some some like hard questions, right? Of just like, well, you know, in the past I've had this like privilege and this ability to just kind of like take off whenever I want and just do whatever I want. Like it's very nice and fun and convenient for me, but is that actually kind of like in the interest of everyone, right? Um, and I think that's one of like the really important themes of the book of this idea of what's kind of nice and convenient and fun for you um as opposed to what is actually good for for the community that you're in well i think even in the section you read right so the character is trying to find the perfect angle for the picture that she would presumably post on social media while outside the bus people are rummaging through garbage to eat yeah um and that's you know like what I was saying before about like the image of this idea of like things just kind of being like a backdrop to your experience, right? Um, I mean, the book doesn't really like, I mean, it engages with it like somewhat of like this idea of, um, you know, volunteerism, um, poverty tourism, um, with this idea of, oh, well, I'm gonna just kind of like show up, um, and, and help out and it makes the individual feel like really good and like self-important, but is it actually like helping the community that, that they're in, right? I think that idea of like, what does actual authentic help or like justice or support, like what does that actually look like? It might not actually be the thing that feels very comfortable to you, right? If you're coming from a very privileged position, like what is actually like authentically helpful might actually feel quite uncomfortable for you. So, yeah. You know, one of the things I was struck by, one of the many things I was struck by in the novel was this kind of link between childhood and, um, and maybe like art creation. Like the way children, like if you think of the creation of art as being a form of play, 
then it kind of helps to be childlike when you're creating or even consuming art. And your, your main, uh, one of your protagonists is, is definitely somebody who's been deeply affected by childhood, I think I would say. Yeah. That. And that somebody who, and she, uh, uh, and there are explicit like mentions in the novel, something about like, I, I think the, 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 the character says something like, I'm looking at this, I know I looked this, at this like a ch as a child, I wonder what it was like looking at it then, and is there any way I could link these two versions of me? Mm -hmm. or, or is that stuff that was going on in, in your uh, creative process when you were writing this? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, like, looking back on your childhood is, like, a universal experience for, for everyone. Um, I think it's usually linked to this desire of just, like, wanting to understand, right? It's just trying to understand, like, where did I come from and how did that affect me, right? Um, so I think that's, a universal instinct in in everyone right whether you kind of reach a certain point and you kind of you know at a certain point in your adulthood you're trying to figure out more how you got to this point and and I guess in the book like that act of looking back appears in the form of an actual physical journey right where like the main character travels back to Medellin the place where she lived in as a child she only lived there until she was eight years old and then she had to leave um so so childhood is definitely a very important theme of the book and I think one of the reasons why it's why a lot of writers find it interesting to engage with childhood or child characters is because when you're a child you don't actually understand everything that's going on and so that can be a very fun perspective to write about right where like the readers might have a greater understanding of like oh this is really like not an ideal situation um yeah a kind of a, an irony where where the reader is understanding more than what the child narrator is um yeah so i think i think childhood and like writing from the perspective of children is is something that i've, I've been interested in in both books i mean I'm, I'm conspicuously trying to avoid saying as little about what happens in the book because i think one of the great pleasures of it is the way revelations kind of pile up on each other but there are i'll, I'll say in a, in a kind of vague way that there are supernatural slash horror elements to this which mm -hmm. is you know, a great, co intriguing combination, to say the least. Tell me about your decision uh, to, to kind of blend these elements that are usually not found together. Yeah, um, I mean, personally, I really liked reading writers like Mariana Enriquez, the Argentinian writer, where um, her collection was translated as Things We Lost in the Fire. And she she's translated like stories by H.P. Lovecraft. She's like a huge H.P. Lovecraft fan. And I just thought it was really interesting how in her story she used these tropes from Lovecraft and from horror fiction to explore the after effects of the war in Argentina. Um, so that's something that I've consistently found very interesting. Another writer, Roberto Bolaño, who I wrote my PhD thesis on. Um, he was also a huge horror fan. So that's that's an interesting pattern I've observed of these um, kind of contemporary Latin American writers who are using these tropes from like genre fiction, crime. Um, I mean, it's not just like contemporary, like you have someone like Borges, right? Who was just like obsessed with like the detective story and the figure of the detective. Um, so I find that very interesting of like using um, imagery from genre fiction of like this idea of like, oh, there's like a closed door and there's something on the other side of it, right? Like what's there, what's behind the closed door, like what's trying to get out, right? Um, I think that that fear is a really, again like it's a very universal emotion um and so i think like the advantage of of using like tropes from horror or like soup the supernatural in your fiction is that it's it's a useful way to evoke a feeling in a reader 
right? And like, that's something that I like to experience as a reader. Like, I like to feel things, right? I like to feel emotions. Um, so that's what's, what's useful about, about using those tropes. And then also more simply, it's, it's, it's the kind of fiction that I, that I enjoy reading, like stuff that kind of combines the horror with, horror with the supernatural. Now, do you feel that Columbia lends itself to that? Because like when I've been there, you know, I'm like, yeah, I could see why, even if I can't put my finger on it, I'm no literary scholar, but I could see how magical realism came to be associated with this place, if that makes any sense. It's yeah. Um, I mean, what I sort of like miss about Columbia and what I really enjoy about going back there is... Um, just like the openness of Colombians, right? Like that's like, not to diss England, I love England, I've lived here a long time, but like the British, you know, I love the Brits, but they're a lot more reserved. <laughs> so the fact that um, in Colombia, like the opportunity you have to just kind of like talk to people and have them like be very open to you. And so then that's, um, you hear some, you hear stories, you know, you hear like crazy stories. Um, I was in Cali in September of last year and I was just like in a taxi and the driver, you know, I was telling him like, oh, I live in England, blah, blah, blah. And he was telling me that he lived in Berlin. And I was like, oh, like, why did you go to Berlin? And he was like, oh, well, I used to be like a cop. But then, you know, so a cop in Kali in like the 90s, like imagine, right? Like there, he had some problems, right? So again, this whole dramatic story came out in like a 10 minute cab ride, right? So um, yeah, so I guess you can see that. Yeah, I find it interesting that like a country that has experienced um, so much, right? That this, like using the kind of tools of storytelling or like of narrative, like that kind of helps give like a structure to it maybe so that you feel, cause I think, you know, I think like the worst feeling is to like, like feel that you're suffering with no point, right? That this like pain had no purpose. So maybe there's something about putting an experience into words or like narrating it as a story that makes it feel meaningful, right? Um, so maybe there is a connection there of like a country that's experienced a lot has also led to kind of a fruitful tradition of storytelling. I don't know. I'm not a social scientist. These are like very <laughs> vague generalizations, but, but yeah. You're not a social scientist, but I think you're on firm ground when you say that the average Brit is more reserved than the average Colombian. You're all right <laughs> I stand by that. Yeah, I stand by that. You're good, you're good well, on that. Love all my British friends, though. Now, listen, your main character is constantly like being referred to as a gringa. And, and, and they're using it, I think, the characters in the book to kind of distance her as somebody who should not really understand the situation she's in. And she's constantly saying, I'm actually from here. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm actually Colombian and, and I'm coming back. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that that give, uh, you, I, it seems to me it gives the character authority. Do you think a novelist needs authority? for example, to write two books about Colombia? That's a really good question. Um, I think in terms of the character, um, it's like interesting to like write characters who aren't certain or who like aren't on stable ground. I think like a character who is kind of very comfortable with themselves and like their place in the world um, aren't that interesting. And also, I don't really know if I know anybody like that in real life. I mean. I'm sure they must be out there. Um, but, but yeah, so it's interesting to me to have a character who um, doesn't really like fit in kind of either world, right? She's lived in England for a long time, but she doesn't quite fit in there. Um, but when she goes back to Colombia, she obviously doesn't quite fit in there too. Um, in terms of like the authority of the novelist, I think that that's a decision that every reader can kind of like make on their own. And I think that a reader reading a work, like they can always like sense that authority, right? In terms of the kind of like authenticity or like control that a writer has over their work. Um, 
I don't know if that answers. I think you're right. I think authority ultimately comes from your ability to use the language and not from what you know you can check off on a resume or where you might have lived at some point. Um, yeah. But I do think it raises some interesting interesting questions. There's, it's, it's one of the things that kind of hangs in the air now, whether you have the authority to write certain uh, countries or, or uh, groups. Of course. And, you know, I, I work as a writing teacher, so that is a concern that I see in my students constantly, where they have, like, a lot of anxiety of, like, whether they have um, permission to explore certain material. Um, but... But yeah, I mean, I think authority comes from from research. So, and it doesn't necessarily have to be like lived experience. It can be like good research, good imagination, just like good use of of the tools that you have at your disposal as a novelist, which is is language primarily. Um, what's the term you use? Volunteerism. Yeah. Okay. Is that is that something you coined or that's a th that's out there, right? That's a oh, thing. I wish I could say, yeah, I, it's my word. No, I think it's been floating around. For so let's while. talk about it, right? So, I mean, I think you draw this link between, well, let's call it tourism as a form of consumption. Let's call it, mm -hmm. right? And then at other parts, I thought um, I, I, it occurred to me like what the tourist is trying to consume, and this is stated explicitly a couple of times, is a kind of authenticity. Right. So there's nothing the the tourist from England or the United States who goes to Medellin is not technically finding something in Medellin that is, you know, they can't find back home. But it's almost that they want uh, they're searching for a kind of authenticity that they don't have in their daily lives or, or perceive that they might not have. Mm -hmm. what, what, what? Yeah, it's um, I mean, to me. I mean, I think the most of the book might have already been like written like when this happened, but like I remember like reading when like the protests were going on in like the New York airports, like at LaGuardia, like after Trump's immigration ban, um, that someone went up to like Stephen Miller, like that fucking shitty man, and he was eating in like a Mexican restaurant. Right. And so people went up and confronted him directly. And to me, I found that so sickening that he was eating at a Mexican restaurant and kind of consuming and ingesting um, food from this culture that, you know, um, was like linked to these racist immigration policies he was trying to impose. So I find that kind of hypocrisy sickening and just like repugnant, right? Um, and that's a bit of a, a rant <laughs> and a bit of a side, but, but yeah, in terms of um, this idea of this kind of just like mindless tourism and just kind of like mindless, like thoughtless consumption, right? It was just like thinking about your own pleasure, your own satisfaction of like, I'm just like moving through the world in like a very comfortable way and like not really thinking about how my comfort is the direct result of me squashing and like oppressing other people, um, I think is, is obviously like a question that I'm, I'm interested in, you know? Um, so yeah, so I think tourism ties into that in the sense of like, um, you know, like what am I trying to get of just trying to have this country as like a backdrop or as like a brochure for like my comfort and like my pleasure, right? So. Well, I, I'm gonna quote, one of your characters says while in, in Medellin, um, speaking of England, I think, says, quote, the people aren't alive there, meaning in England, not like here. And I knew exactly what the character was talking about. And I have felt that sensation myself. But I'm wondering if it's legitimate. Yeah, um, I mean, there's something that's like a bit like colonial and like fetishistic about it, I think, where it's just kind of like, oh, you know, um, like the liveliness of this like warm, tropical country and I mean I was just like saying that like a bit earlier right it's just kind of like the people in Colombia are like very like warm and friendly um but like 
I think it's, um, there's, I think it's like talking about that, like aliveness. Um, you know, I'm just like very like hesitant about, um, of just like this, I mean, almost this kind of like colonial mentality, right? And like, that's like what made me nervous about seeing tourism develop in Colombia. And again, it's like, I'm not a tourism expert. I'm not like an economist. Like I'm, I'm a novelist. Like what I do is like create fictional experiences for, for readers. But obviously there is, you know, a personal concern of just like not wanting to see the country I grew up in, like, be exploited, you know, of, like, having, like, the oil and, like, natural resources exploited, like, that's not something I want to see happen, um, so hopefully, um, that won't happen, but we'll see. So you identify part of the novelist's job is to create certain kind of experiences, and I will say that some of the experiences you create in this novel are, are very difficult for the reader. Mm -hmm. um, were they difficult for the writer? Or is, <laughs> is it, are you living a different life when you're writing those sections than when you're writing a purely comic section or a purely comic short story? Um, that's a good question. It's hard to like remember how I felt when like writing certain sections. Um, I do think it's funny, like my my twin sister, when she was like posting about the ant hole on social media, she was like, this is a difficult book. This is not comfort reading. And so part of me was kind of like, yeah, thank you, sis. I don't know like how much like my editor or like my publicist would yeah, like. Yeah, tell your sis you say that after people have bought it. You don't say <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, I was like, this like book will make you feel very uncomfortable. Um, but I think like for me personally, like those are the kinds of books I like to read. I mean, again, it like depends on your mood, but um, I like feeling that I have to participate in the reading experience. I kind of have to co-create the meaning of the book. And sometimes that can be challenging because the, the imagery is disturbing. Um, it can be unsettling. It can be confusing because you don't know what it means, but but for me personally, for now at least, like that's um, the kind of fiction I'm interested in in writing. Um, You're talking I, about the effect on the reader. Yeah. Okay. I want to know the effect on the writer. Yeah. Um, the effect on the writer. I mean, right, so I, like, uh, let me let me break it down. Right before you start writing, that you have to decide to go there, uh, mm -hmm. and you have to, in a sense, live the events in a way that it seems to me even deeper than reading. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know when I wrote the ending of the book, I just like, I burst into tears. It was like a very physical and that had never happened to me before. So that was really crazy um, and intense. Yeah. I think writing, um, I think it takes a lot of courage. It's not like an easy thing to do. I mean, earlier we were talking about like concentration, um, I mean, to me, it's like interesting how writing can be like a very physical experience. Like I don't always like type, I kind of go back and forth. Sometimes I type, like sometimes I, I write by hand. And so sometimes it is interesting to see kind of like where you're getting like really tense or like stiff in your body or like, um, maybe your heart is like racing as you're writing a particular scene or maybe there's a particular part that you procrastinate writing because you know it's gonna be like really tough for your character. So it's like, it's gonna to be tough for you too. So yeah, it's it's a weird thing to do with your time. <laughs> it's strange, um, but, but I think very fulfilling. And I think that's why a lot of people want to do it because there's something very unique about having that connection between like what you're inventing um, and the kind of like physical response you're experiencing. What, if anything, are you reading right now? Um, well, one of the books I just finished was a book called Crash, no, Slash and Burn by this writer from El Salvador, Claudia Hernandez. 
Um, it's just been translated and it's a book about ex-combatants from the El Salvador Civil War kind of transitioning into post-Civil War life, like transitioning into, into peace. Um, so that was obviously a very interesting book for me to read because obviously that's a big theme in Colombia right now of how ex-combatants are transitioning from, from war to peace, right? So, so thematically that, um, that's like very interesting to me to explore. To explore. Um, so I read that book and then I read the book Hurricane Season by Fernando Melchor, a Mexican writer, and that was incredible. So yeah, I would also say, um, if you don't have the money to buy the ant hole, like buy Hurricane Season by Fernando Melchor, it was, it was incredible. Um, it was kind of like a, um, a crime story set in Mexico. It's about how violence affects women. Um, and that was like a book that, that had like a real like physical impact on me. Um, and yeah, so those are the kind of books I really like to read where like they really um, make me feel something physically and emotionally. Do you read a, a lot of fiction while you're writing fiction? I do, yeah. Um, I know some people who don't because they say that they don't want to be contaminated, but I can't imagine doing that. I think if I had to choose between reading or writing, I would choose reading probably. I mean, in a way it's kind of a silly choice to kind of set it up that way. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, reading to me is so instrumental and like so um, key. So, so yeah, I'll usually like read a little bit of something I like before before I write. What influences your teaching, if any, have on your writing? That's a really good question. Um, so I've been teaching for about six years, which isn't, it's not like a lifetime. It's not like a super long time, but it's not like a small amount of time either. Um, and I mean, I think one helpful thing about like teaching is because as a teacher, a lot of the time, like you're not, at least in terms of my personal philosophy, like you're not instructing or kind of like telling students what to do or like giving them knowledge. You're um, ideally, you're just helping them figure it out for themselves, right? Of just kind of encouraging them, right? Of letting them find their own path. So teaching has been helpful for me in the sense that, um, you know, if I'm giving my students a certain kind of piece of advice, then I need to like follow it myself. And usually that advice is like, trust yourself, you'll figure it out, right? So, yeah. Um, and I guess what's also been helpful about teaching is just the ability to, um, yeah, like read other people's work and just encounter like really interesting writing on the page that you wouldn't encounter otherwise. Like I always find that um, really fruitful, you know, just being able to like meet different people with like different, different backgrounds. You know, I've had students where like they worked as, as lawyers, as translators, um, as journalists. So that's really helpful to just like meet people with such diverse backgrounds. So are you like a drafts person? Like, oh, this is my eighth draft of the Ann Hill, or are you more like when I'm done, it's pretty much done. Let's just copy edit. I'm a draft person. I don't know if that's the best way. Most to teachers be, would be, but, right? Yeah, I mean, again, it's like everyone's different. I don't know if one way is better than the other. Probably like plotting it all out and having it all planned is like better. Um, but yeah, I'm just, I'm a big old mess. <laughs> I'm just like, it takes me a long time to figure out. Um, what I'm doing, but then that's part of the, the fun for me, right? Where it feels like it's a puzzle that I'm trying to figure out. Um, and I think that's why a lot of people um, like want to be writers in this day and age or like enjoy writing because it's so rare that you get to do something where you actually see like the direct fruit or the direct result of your labor, right? Of like, okay, like I made that, like this was like the impact that I had. I created that. I think that's a feeling that a lot of people have. And I think a lot of people like also want to feel that like, I think like one of the worst feelings in the world is to feel that like you're not being listened to or that like your voice doesn't matter or that like you're not being heard. It's like when you're like a little kid, like I don't know if this ever happened to you as a child, but it's like, you know, like the silent treatment where people like pretend you're invisible, like pretend you don't exist. It's happened to um, me as an adult. 
yeah <laughs> like that can just like feel like like torture um and so yeah i think that's why a lot of people at least in the students i've seen they're turning their writing because people want to feel like you know it's like ultimately like we all want to feel like our lives matter and like oh the cat's in the background so you'll have to nice pansy she's yeah. she wants to she held, almost out, she held out almost to the end she held out almost to the end but now she's like i i want to appear on camera what, um, are you working on something now I, don't, you don't have to, I wouldn't say what it is if you don't want to uh, <laughs> no but. it's okay um so i had this idea where i wanted to write like three novellas that were connected and like one of the novellas was like set on like a faraway planet of like a woman just living alone, like in like, isolation. And then that was the section I was working on when this whole COVID thing hit. And you're the reason we're in this situation. <laughs> and I was like, shit, like, I don't really want to spend all my time writing about someone who just like never leaves like the space they're in. And it's just kind of like trap. I was just like, yeah. Um, so, you know, I predicted this whole thing basically. I yeah, know. I mean, a lot of people, you hear a lot of like, are you going to write a novel about the pandemic or are you going to write a novel about COVID? And it's just like, I think the novel is like a really bad instrument for dealing with current events. So the answer to oh, that, most, most of the people I know who write are like, absolutely not. No yeah. interest. Like, that's the last thing I want to read and yeah. write right now, basically. Somebody wants to know what your favorite Colombian food is. Ooh. Um, can you, and can you get it where you are? Oh, no, yeah. I can't. In London, I can, but not where I live, like not in Norwich. Um, I love like all the soups, so ajiaco, sancocho, um, anything that's like really salty. Um, and like the, the juices, right? So anything that's kind of like, I mean, basically mango, you know, it's just like a nice, simple, like mango, like licuado. Um, yeah. The fruit in Colombia is insane. Mm -hmm. You just yeah, walk around. Exactly. They're really up. fresh fruit. Um, yeah, and like the suits. That's what I meant. Um, I think they want us to switch over to Q&A, but I think we've kind of been answering the Q&A questions while we're doing it. Oh, great. Um, so I'll give it up to you. You're like- Somebody wanted to know where you were broadcasting from in quotes, and I think you, <laughs> you just answered that. I'm um, in your living room. Yeah. 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 I'm I'm right by the modem because I wanted to make sure I had like a good internet connection. Hey, yeah, that's, that's, that's everything now. Um, what, what, um, do you, do you read poetry? Do you watch movies? Do you listen to a lot of music? Um, probably out of those, it's probably like movies more than anything else. Um, music too. Um, I actually like just watched like the Michael Jordan documentary and I actually found it. I mean, it was basically kind of like a commercial for like how great Michael Jordan is, but I actually also found it really helpful in the sense of like, you know, like Michael Jordan, he was a really confident person, you know, like he really believed in himself. Right. Um, and apparently one of the things his coaches said was that he was like really good at just like being in the present moment and like not worrying about the future, not worrying about the past. And like, that's what made him like a great player. And I was just like, that's really good advice for writing or like for life in general. So who would have thought like Michael Jordan is like useful um, for everyone, but just goes to show that you can find inspiration and like helpful things from, from everywhere. You know? I think what maybe what you're hitting on is we talked earlier about like having the authority to write certain things. Mm -hmm. A big part of writing fiction is giving yourself the authority to be like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, can, I can do whatever I want. And there's that freedom there. So are you saying that, that that's something that in the past you've struggled with or that you just, what did the Michael Jordan documentary bring up in you about that? I think like, yeah, I mean, I don't think I'm, you know, I don't know, like, do any of us have like confidence on the level of like Michael Jordan? I don't <laughs> know that, but, um, but I think that idea of like stubbornness or like tenacity, um, you know, I mean, 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's like a good quality to have. I think like anyone who's like interested in writing, I don't know, like this idea of like talent or being talented. I don't know about that, but I think like um, just like being really stubborn and like being really like pig headed of just like, I'm going to do this like no matter what. Um, and like nothing's going to stop me. Um, I don't know if that's like confidence or just like stupidity. <laughs> I'm like, well, it's like a kind of a cliche, but do your students like come up to you and say, come on, tell me right now, do I have talent? That um, thankfully no one's asked me that like that directly. Um, it's almost like they're hoping that you will say there's this other thing that will do the hard work for you. You have this magical yeah. thing that's going to do the hard work for you. So don't worry. Yeah. I'm kind of ignoring the fact that whether you have talent or not, you're still going to have to like really work hard. Yeah. I mean, like, thankfully, um, I've never had a student like that yet, like knock wood. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I would say sometimes like people I've seen like go on and do well, it's like not always like the people who like won all the prizes or like won a lot of praise. Um, like I think sometimes that can maybe even be kind of like detrimental cause it kind of makes you like very comfortable or kind of like think like, oh, well, like I'm already like hot shit or whatever. Um, but I think. I think just having the ability to just kind of be like humble and keep your head down. And again, this idea of just like, I'm just gonna like focus and kind of spend my time doing something that's like very valuable to me. Okay, but if if the trade-off is like, all right, so the undercurrent of Last Dance was like a lot of people, basically if you read between the lines, like Michael Jordan was kind of an asshole. Yeah, the toxic yeah. leader. Uh, and, mm -hmm. but, it, but, you know, he would say, I think that it was, that that's okay, that it was worth it um would, would you feel that way if everybody said she's 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 kind of a terrible person but she's basically virginia Woolf, yeah i'm like the, would that be all right would you the trade workout that? leader with like the iron whip or whatever um no i don't know i don't know if i'm like that i mean obviously um you know i teach i teach in a writing workshop and so um i can see how it can be harmful for people right of like bringing something in and having it read um too early right i can see how that can be like harmful or like detrimental to a person um i would say at least like in the place where where i work the the philosophy is more about just being a tool for people to like kind of figure it out on their own, you know? So you're not really there to kind of like beat anyone down or like raise anyone up or kind of tell anyone what to do. Um, but, you know, I was a student in the same program like where, where I teach and that was something, yeah, I don't really know if I like learned anything or was like taught anything, but I was just kind of like given an opportunity to just kind of like figure things out on my own. So that's kind of like my teaching philosophy of just kind of like try to encourage people and like not like be like a nice, kind, supportive person. Yeah, you're a very nice person. I didn't mean to say yeah, I am. <laughs> what's, what's with the Darth Vader blanket people want to know? Are you a big Star Wars fan? <laughs> that's just like on the couch. It's like a throw. You but know? Is, it, is it indicative of some kind of fandom or no? Oh, well, you know, it's like, obviously, I like the original, like okay, the, the yeah. remake, I haven't seen so much. But, but yeah, there's, there's no like deeper meaning to the to the Star Wars blankets. It's, it's, it's a nice throw. Um, so, Andy, let me give you a hypothetical. I'm someone who has no connection to Colombia, but I want to go try. Uh, I want to travel there. How can I do it without being the kind of person you and I have identified in the last hour? How can I do it responsibly? I think like one thing to do um, is I'm like, I mean, this sounds kind of like dumb because it's kind of like, what do I know? And like, who am I to kind of like give advice? But I think like an interesting thing to experiment with is like not just be so obsessed with like taking a photograph, you know, um, maybe just like, yeah, just try like walking around and not worry so much of like, I'm going to go to this place to get a photograph to like consume it, you know? Um, I mean, again, it's like, who am I to judge? Like if that kind of, I don't know, um, maybe I should judge, but, but yeah, I think, I think that might be like one helpful step. Um, I think it's also like, we can't fall into this trap 
of like the expectation of like perfection, right? Because it's kind of like, you know, it's good to have high standards for ourselves and to like want to improve and like want to be better. But at the same time, I mean, I was talking to my dad about this book, right? And like he and my mother like worked in development for like 35 years, right? Um, and my dad was like, yeah, like even like living in a country for 35 years and speaking the language fluently, knowing the culture, even then you're still like, is my presence here actually helping, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's like, there's no easy answer. I'm gonna reframe one of the questions you got slightly. Which character did you miss the most when you were done writing? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think the character Gabriela, who's like one of the little kids in the book, she's like a girl with like a lot of spirit. Um, she was very fun. She was a very fun character. Cause I think like kid characters who like aren't very well behaved, who are like very naughty, they're very fun. Green light, want to step in here at some point? I think we've gone over time. I'm, I'm a little bit over. Yeah, there you go. Hi. Uh, thank you so much, Julianne and Sergio, for this wonderful conversation. And thank you to everyone who showed up tonight. Um, thank you to Julianne's cat for showing up. So cute. Good <laughs> Um, a reminder that tonight's event has been recorded, so if you missed any part of it for any reason, or if you have friends who missed it, um, keep an eye out for a version of it on our website and social media channels later on. And a reminder that you can buy The Ant Hill through greenlightbookstore.com, and you can get $5 off with code Ant Hill. Um, thanks again so much, everyone, for tonight. It was lovely, and have a wonderful evening. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sergio. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Bye. Yeah,